Yeah, we've seen a lot today already that isoprene is really important for the southeast and now following up on Luisa's talk, I'm going to have a more detailed look at uh, isoprene emissions and try to validate that with our measurements. And the way I'm going to do this, I'm going to estimate isoprene emissions from the two campaigns that we had in the southeast, Cenex and Nomads, and then compare those estimates of emissions with uh, inventories. And I'll do that in various different ways, you know, um, and including a, a different model in Luisa used, the WARFCAM model in this case. So this is what we have as data, as input for, for this analysis. So those are the fly tracks from Cenex and Nomads on top of uh, biogenic emissions map, so this is the base emissions of uh, BIAS 3.13 in this case, and the flight tracks are only in the boundary layer that are shown here, and they are color coded by isoprene. So we have lots of, of data available for this analysis, but I'm most heavily going to lean on the PTRMS data from the NOAA P3 and the C130. And the C130 actually ran the PTRMS at a really high frequency to be able to measure eddy covariance fluxes along the flight track. I'm going to use uh, BIAS 3.12 and 3.13 and Megan 2.0. And I'm going to compare it to the WARFCAM model at the end as well. So to do a really quantitative comparison along the flight track of isoprene emissions, I'm going to do this in four, four steps. The first one is I'm going to determine the emissions along the flight track from um, the measurements of isoprene using the mixed boundary layer method. And after that, I'll compare that to the emissions that I estimate from the inventories using aircraft data as input as well. So this first two steps we have done for previous campaigns in the past, and that is a published method. And then the next two steps, those are new that we have only been able to do here for Cenex and Nomads. And that is using the eddy-covariance technique to determine fluxes of isoprene. And then the WARFCAM model, we didn't have that in the past either. So here is how the the emissions are estimated. The top shows the mixed boundary layer method in this case. So this method assumes that isoprene is emitted, mixed out throughout the boundary layer, and the, the mixing ratio that's measured to the aircraft is then dependent on its lifetime. So what you need to know for that is isoprene measured, the boundary layer height, so the mixing volume, and the OH, which is the lifetime, basically. So for the emissions inventory, Luisa explained that already clearly you need a base emissions, and then uh, the metrology, basically the light and temperature the dependence of um, those emissions. And the same idea is for BIAS and for Megan. And again, I'm using aircraft data as input for this here. So here is shown how the mixed boundary layer method works for one flight. So here is the flight track color coded with isoprene. And here is the altitude profile, again color coded with isoprene. And this shows how high isoprene mixes. Isoprene and other um, tracers I use to then determine the boundary layer height shown here in blue. The OH I take from an estimate using a parameterization that's uh, suggested by Ehalt et al. And um, the result is shown here. This uh, takes the, the J values and NO2 as input um, and then it parameterizes OH. So if I multiply this out here in the formula up, up there, I get isoprene emissions along the flight track, and they are shown down here in this plot. And I will use five-minute averages for most of the quantitative comparison because of the natural variability that isoprene has. It would be very hard to really uh, compare one-second measurements with each other and also with models. Um, of course, this method has, has quite some error. And the first one to note here is the entrainment flux out of the boundary layer, which could be as high as 30%. The next one is isoprene that we measure at the aircraft, of course, comes from a certain region and not right under the aircraft, as I'm assuming here. And also OH uh, ages um, differently along the footprint to where we actually measure it at the aircraft. Isoprene has, because of its short lifetime, a gradient throughout the boundary layer. It will complicate this analysis. And of course, the OH parameterization gives a, um, a prob or is a, a large uh, source for uncertainty. But during NOMADS, I was pointed out by Chris Contrell this morning, there were good measurements of OH. And here's a comparison of the measurements for one of those flights, uh, the parameterization versus uh, the measurement. And this is actually very encouraging. And the agreement shown for all the flights color coded in the boundary layer here is actually very good, which gives us quite a good confidence in this OH that we are using for this method. So here is then the next step, the emissions calculated, in this case, from BIAS 3.12. So we have the BIAS base emissions that we need. We extracted along the flight track. Uh, 
And then the light and temperature dependence shown down here is calculated out using the exact same uh, canopy environment model that's used in the WarfCam model. So we basically took the Fortran code, adapted it to be able to, to use aircraft data as an input for that. And the result is shown here as a time series along the flight track. And again, we multiply this all out and end up with emissions. And they're shown down here for, again, for the one second data and the five minute averages. And I overlaid here already uh, our, the, the mixed boundary layer method that I showed earlier. So the next step to do the same thing is for Megan. So it, the method is exactly the same, so I'm gonna, not gonna go through this in detail again. So here down here is the, the result shown and um, for all three methods are, are shown here in, in this time series. So here's now a quantitative look at the comparison. So what I do is always I take the five minute data and fit the slope through that and in this case I, I use the emissions from bias versus the mixed boundary layer, layer method. And this is summarized over here in this graph. And right off the bat, Senex and Nomads then is compared to, to all the other campaigns that we did in the past. And you can see that those, those two campaigns are very consistent as a result um, to what we've seen in previous campaigns. So here's the ratio of the inventory to the mixed boundary layer method. And you, you can also see, according to our previous results, Megan is always higher and Bias is always somewhat lower than what we estimate from our measurements. So, as I said earlier, the um, PTRMS on the C-130 was run in, in a fast mode that you can do eddy covariance flux measurements. And there was also racetracks flown that Chris already alluded on earlier to, to be able to determine isoprene fluxes in these racetracks at different altitudes to get a better handle on that and the eddy covariance fluxes. So here's the formula how to calculate isoprene emissions from these fluxes. So it's basically the average of the fluctuating term of the vertical wind and the isoprene mixing ratios that you measure. I don't want to go into detail, but the results are just shown here, in, in this case in green, and I overlaid our mixed boundary layer method on the same time series here as well. So I'm using this, this as an example because I call this the good and the bad. So there's two racetracks in the same general area. This is, happens to be Northeast Texas. And one of the profiles, that's this one here, the two methods agree actually very well within a few percent and the correlation plot of this, this profile here is sh shown down here. And I think this is actually an excellent agreement. But the other profile in, an, in a relatively close area does not agree very well. And generally speaking, the mixed boundary layer method is higher than, um, than the eddy covariance flux measurements. And just as to show if this is there as, as a tiebreaker, I put the bias emissions on that we calculated earlier, and, and you can see that it lies right in between the two methods in this case. So here is the quantitative comparison of the two um, measurement methods of determining fluxes. The mixed boundary layer method, the eddy covariance flux measurements. On average, as I've shown for, before in the time series, the, the eddy covariance fluxes are somewhat lower. But at this point, I should say that these fluxes are calculated at the aircraft height. And as you can see here in the altitude profile, the fluxes are getting, the measured fluxes are lower the higher you go into, in, in the boundary layer. And at this point, those, all those data are very preliminary and we're working on really determining the surface fluxes and, and trying to understand better why the two methods disagree and, and where they disagree. In. So next is comparing everything that we've looked at so far with the WARFCAM model. So this is basically a relatively similar method that uh, Luisa did before, except that I use aircraft data as an input for, for the um, model as well. So what's shown here is basically the sanity check. So here are the, the emissions from BIOS 3.13 versus BIOS 3.14, which is used in WARFCAM. So WARFCAM was run at a 12 kilometer resolution using NEI 2011 and bias 3.14 as the emissions input. So, and here is the comparison of, of bias. In this case, run with the WARFCAM metrology, and in this case, run with the, the aircraft um, measurements of the metrology. And you can see they agree very well. So, this is the sanity check. The emissions that, that bias uh, gives us for the model and for the measurements agree very well. And the metrology that goes in is compared down here. and the comparison is good enough so that we get really a very quantitative comparison for the emission input.
But as we've seen earlier, that the, the emissions that I get from our mixed boundary layer method are higher than what we have estimated from bias. And this is the comparison here, the mixed boundary layer method emissions versus what uh, WarfCam thinks the emissions are. And again, here there are a factor of two apart, as we've seen earlier, very consistent. So this then leads us to the comparison from the emissions to the mixing ratios. And the mixing ratios are shown here as a time series for two separate flights. I took two different ones. The upper one shows an excellent agreement. For such a short-lived species as isoprene, I think the model measurement agreement, in this case on five-minute data, is, is very good. And the second plot shows a different flight where the, the agreement in the variability is very good, but the, um, the measurements are about a factor of two higher than what we see from the WARFCAM model, which is uh, consistent with, with what we saw the, in the emissions input is. So here's a, a more detailed look at this intercomparison. So the, the WARFCAM isoprene versus the measured isoprene. And here we see this factor of two on the average uh, difference, as we've seen for the emissions input. But of course, nothing's ever that simple, and uh, everything's linked with each other. Here is the comparison of the OH of WARFCAM with the measurements. And you can see there's also a factor of two difference. So the lifetime of isoprene and WARFCAM is actually a factor of two shorter, which should, also, uh, a lot, which should result in a factor of two lower isoprene as well. So last but not least, I want, I want to point one other thing out. If you're flying around in the southeast in the US, you happen to see a lot of these really large spikes of monoterpenes and methanol and other compounds like that, that we usually think as biogenic compounds. And in this case, they actually happen to be paper mills that are processing all these, these trees that are in the southeast. Um, so this brings me to my summary. So again, we'll, we'll try to quantify and verify the emissions of isoprene. And as we've seen in the past, the emissions that we estimate from the aircraft measurements are somewhat higher than what we see from BIAS and lower than what we see from Megan. And the eddy covariance flux me method that we have um, now is uh, showing somewhat lower measurement. Uh, emissions than the mixed boundary layer method. And wharf chem, again, is consistent with uh, the emissions input and the isoprene that wharf chem predicts is somewhat lower than the measurements. So of course, this is, this is only a start in our analysis. What we really have to do is understand the, the differences between the eddy covariance method and the mixed boundary layer method. Then of course, we have to use Megan 2.1, which is certainly the, the right tool to use at this moment, the moment instead of 2.0. And then um, also 3.14 of bias needs to be used. And the next step will be also to incorporate then Megan 2.1 into our WARFCAM model to compare the two better. And I want to end with uh, thanking all the, the people who contributed to this work. Yes. Yes, I, I totally agree with you. And then the entertainment flux was certainly relatively large, especially during the Senex period. And there's um, a poster by Nick Wagner who actually looks at uh, the difference of the, the residual layer on top of the boundary layer. And you do find some isoprene in there. But isoprene is so short-lived, it's, it's a little hard to do this. But we have to do it. Yes. Yes, clearly, and, and that's, we're in the process of doing this, so I, I don't have any results for that yet. Dylan? <laughs> that's a good question. We, we've looked at that in the past with uh, flex bar transport modeling, and it is clearly different, but I, I would say on average it's going to even 
it out a little bit because you, you always make an error in, in either direction of where you fly and the wind comes from. But it, it's, several, it's, it's probably half an hour transport or an hour transport upwind. And that depends on the wind speed at that moment, obviously. So All less right. than a lifetime. Well, I'm afraid we have to move <laughs> on. So thanks again. Thank you.